Hello guys and welcome to the Rebound Talks podcast, where you find the best tools, tips and techniques needed to overcome any adversity. I'm your host Antonio Colmenares and today we're going to be speaking with Dean Radin, PhD. He's the chief scientist at the Institute of Noetic Science, IONS, and has studied consciousness for over three decades. He's the author or co-author of hundreds of scientific articles and is the author of four popular books, including the Scientific and Medical Network's 1997 book award, The Conscious Universe. He's also written Entangled Minds and the 2014 Silver Nautilus Book Award, Super Normal. His last book is called Real Magic, and we're going to be diving deeply into what he says in this interview. Aside from that, we're going to be talking about the depths of consciousness, how he worked at a secret government program, how was he recruited, what were they studying, and what the future of science might be like. Stay tuned. Hello, Dean. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you. Thank you for coming on. I really appreciate it. Sure. I want to start with uh, your background. How does a concert violinist then go to studying electrical engineering, psychology, and now the science of consciousness? Uh, well, like, like many scientists, I've always been interested in everything. And unfortunately, you can't do everything all at the same time, so you, you can do it in sequence. So I started playing the violin when I was five years old, mainly because as a five-year-old, you don't, you don't know anything. So my parents said, here, go do this. So I turned out to have some talent in playing the violin and just continued to do that for the next 20 years because, again, that's kind of what I knew how to do. But along the way, I started uh, reading books and science fiction and fairy tales and, uh, and engineering and mathematics and science. I realized that there, was, there were ways of making a living that did not require being an athlete because we don't normally think of it, but being a musician, you have to be an athlete in the sense that your body's your instrument. Mm -hmm. And so I've never been particularly strong physically. So I was happy to learn that there was a way to earn, learn a living where I didn't have to play music. So I can do it as, a, as for fun, as mm -hmm. a hobby, but didn't have to rely on it. Most of the professionals I know in the, the music business work really, really hard. And it's, it's hard in the body as well. And so I switched into engineering because I always like to make stuff and I would like to figure out better ways of making things. And then I switched into psychology because uh, when at the time I was in graduate school, artificial intelligence started to be, become a big thing. And I found that interesting. And the university I was at at the time, the only, there were only two faculty members who had any interest in AI. So one was in electrical engineering, the other was in psychology. And I decided I was more interested in the psychological side, things like cognitive simulation and neural networks. So I ended up getting a PhD in psychology, even though more like an accident than anything else, is that because that was the topic that I was interested in. So how did I get from that, which, which has nothing to do with consciousness research? Uh, what sparked that interest was, uh, in my day, I would be doing the equivalent of reading Harry Potter. It wasn't Harry Potter because it wasn't, written, it wasn't written yet, mm -hmm. but there were lots of other stories like that. And so as a kid, you read those stories and you wonder, well, I, I wonder if any of that stuff could be real. And so I never forgot that question. And I noticed going through college and then graduate school that uh, it wasn't only that you're, you never encounter that question, like, like could psychic phenomena really be real? You either never hear anybody talk about that, or if you do hear it, you hear from professors that, no, none of it is real. And I thought that was pretty strange because the majority of the population report experiences that sound psychic, mm -hmm. spontaneous telepathy and precognitive dreams and things like that. And I thought, well, why is this being dismissed so quickly by the academic world when I already knew because I had read a whole bunch of books saying that you could test these things using scientific methods. So I began to test 
uh, psychic phenomena in graduate school and I was getting interesting results and that only made it worse because now I was seeing that th this particular topic about the capacities of consciousness was something that you're not supposed to talk about. And I hadn't realized at that point that there are certain topics that are not taught in the academic world. They're like taboo topics. That got me interested in the sociology of science as well as many other things. Uh, so when I, when I got my doctorate and I went to work at Bell Laboratories doing pretty much conventional work, I continued to look into the capacities of consciousness on the side. And then I made a, a small part of my work at Bell Labs and I became progressively convinced that this, this really is something that's real and worth studying. And so I couldn't find anything more interesting than that. And I've figured out ways of continuing to do that full time. And thank you for doing that. It's really brave of you because I don't know why the scientific community, as you said, sort of like ignore this topic. Why do you think it's so, such a taboo and how can it be reframed so it gets, so the scientific community starts to take it more seriously, how they've done with meditation, for example. Right. So meditation is a good example. 30 years ago, uh, only only crazy people were studying meditation and only people interested in exotic stories from the far East were actually doing meditation. This the same is true then in medicine In medicine, the idea that the mind and body are closely related was considered laughable 30 years ago. So what happened? What happened was that there was a, a big crackdown on psychedelics around the time of a protest, student protests against the Vietnam war. And so a large chunk of society at that time, these are now uh, kids who are professors now. They grew up during a time that wasn't the psychedelic 60s. They grew up at a time when all of it was shut down. And so you have a couple of generations of professors who are very conservative about what they, what they think is worth studying. And only within the past maybe five years do you see now university-based meditation research and, and university-based psychedelic research around the world. And it's slowly beginning to open up again, tolerance, of, and it's simply a matter of that, it's tolerance about what ideas you're gonna study. And so we're seeing cycles, and these cycles have been going on in terms of uh, what culture de deems to be acceptable studies. And so that what culture deems to be acceptable is reflected in the academic world. And so you get these times when it, consciousness is very popular and then it's not popular and the capacities of consciousness and it, that's what it is. It's culture that drives what is acceptable to talk about, not only in public, but in the academic world as well. And psychedelics are very closely tied with consciousness. I know that you mentioned in your book that they, as well as meditation, help you achieve that gnosis state where I would love you to describe it a little bit more and how you've used this state to test different theories. So what we're talking about here is a state known within the esoteric traditions, Eastern and Western esoteric traditions, where gnosis would, in, from a meditation perspective, uh, be called samadhi or satori. Every, every tradition has a word for something like a mystical state, a state of where your, your sense of self feels like it's the same as the universe. So in an everyday awareness like we're talking now, it sounds silly to say, well, what do you mean that your, your, your sense of self feels like the universe? But that is what happens in a mystical state. You feel one with everything, literally. In addition, the usual bounds of space and time begin to dissolve. And so you, you find uh, that in yoga, for example, the, the classical book of yoga is Yoga Sutras by Patanjali, written roughly 2,000 years ago. And one part of the book talks about the special powers that are, come about as a result of meditative practice. But one of the most elementary so-called powers, the siddhis, as they call them, is the ability to perceive past, present, and future all at the same time. Now this is just, this happens as a result of, of getting uh, more and more awareness of deeper layers of the mind. And so when you get down deep enough, 
uh, something happens in terms of your ability to perceive reality, and you you can at that point see past, present, and future. Well, so that ability, that city in the yogic tradition, is what happens in gnosis in the esoteric mm-hmm. traditions, and in more popular terms, it's called either clairvoyance or even more modern remote viewing. Mm. It's the same phenomena. You see the same thing throughout history. Culturally, it's shaped in terms of how people talk about it, but that is the same phenomenon. So you look then at who is studying this in the academic world. People who study it are primarily anthropologists and psychologists because in indigenous societies, people are well aware of these things. They use Mm -hmm. these kinds of of phenomena. Uh, so anthropologists can talk about it in those terms. Psychologists tend to talk about it in terms of what people believe, not what might be real, but only in terms of what people believe. So parapsychology then is the discipline that studies, uses scientific methods to study, is that kind of experience real or not? Well, it turns out it's very difficult to study s- mystical experiences because once you're in that state, you you don't want to do anything that somebody's asking you to do, but you can study the, the closest neighbor, which are things like clairvoyance, because then you could run an experiment and ask people to do things like tell me what's happening 20 miles away, uh, and you can find out whether they're correct or not. So science is very good at studying the external world, like the physical world. If science is not so good at studying the interior sense of self, as by you can do a flip side then and say, well, meditation is all about studying the ins- inside. It looks at the universe from the inside, whereas science today mostly looks at the universe from the outside. We're both pushing, you know, we're both looking in the same thing from different directions. I completely agree with you, Dean. And I also want to talk about the universal consciousness you talk about a philosophy that talks about universal consciousness in your book, Real Magic, and how humans have the ability to tap into this universal consciousness, which is sort of what uh, Napoleon Hill was talking about in his book, Think and Grow Rich. He called it infinite intelligence and how geniuses were able to tap into this infinite intelligence to create goals and to achieve what they wanted to achieve. Mm -hmm. So I want to touch upon attention and intention and how these could help you achieve your dreams. So uh, we're talking about consciousness with a little C and consciousness with a big C. Mm -hmm. So the little C consciousness is what you call me. It's, It's your sense of awareness. The big C consciousness is what in the esoteric traditions is considered to be a consciousness or awareness that permeates everything. It's simply part of the fabric of reality. And the, uh, almost all of the esoteric traditions also claim that this big C, which is what mystics talk about, comes prior to the physical world. It, it is fundamental. It's like the most fundamental thing that we know. So from that perspective, the physical world, as we understand it, er, emerges out of, it, it arises out of big C consciousness. Little C consciousness is not separate from that. It's just our experience of big C. So you mentioned about tapping into this universal consciousness. That's not exactly correct because if anybody who already has consciousness, that, that is it. Mm -hmm. That's the same thing, except it goes through all kinds of psychological filters and all kinds of ways of thinking about it. Many people never even think about this at all. Like like, uh, my awareness is the same as universal awareness. Well, yeah, that's what the esoteric traditions say. So if you think about it, if there's some primordial consciousness that saturates the universe and the physical universe arises out of it in some fashion, then we should have that capacity too. We should have the capacity to perceive anywhere in the universe. We should also have the capacity to make or to emerge out of even little c the world around us. So this is why in, in the esoteric traditions, the practice of, of mentally becoming more and more aware, which is typically what meditation does, but there are other techniques as well, 
the more aware you are, the more you're able to manifest things that you wish to emerge into the, into the universe. So that this manifestation process is called magic, traditional magic. In the esoteric traditions, it's called affirmations within the affirmations literature. And as you know, there's a ton of literature talking about why it's so important to focus clearly on what it is that you want to happen. Now, obviously, the, the, the degree of connection between little c and big C in an individual typically is pretty small, right? You have, you have this much going on as compared to the universe. So while I, I think all of us do have the capacity to make affirmations come about, the, the way that it comes about is more like tweaking probabilities, right? There's, a, like, there's a, a probability that all kinds of things can happen, but you're able to tweak it and make it slightly more probable. What that means is, if you said, uh, I, I want to affirm that a gold-plated Mercedes is going to show up on my driveway tomorrow <laughs> simply because I want it, you can change the probability of that simply by wishing it to be so. On the other hand, you're pushing against the rest of the universe, right? So a lot of people have a lot of wishes, and who knows how many other entities there are out there in the universe. All of them are constantly moving and shaping reality, I think. So when you have uh, an affirmation, if it's an affirmation which is already kind of on the cusp of maybe this and maybe that, but there are high probabilities for you, that's when I think the affirmation can come true. So you can, you, you, like you change the probability of the gold-plated Mercedes from one in a hundred trillion of happening to maybe one in a uh, hundred billion. So it could happen. It's just not very likely to happen. Whereas uh, I, I, I want this or that to happen and the, and the next day, which in both things are likely for you, either one could happen. If you strongly affirm one of those versus the other, that is more likely to happen because you're able to kind of push it over the probabilistic edge. So this is, this is more of a, a modern statistical way of thinking about what's going on with, with the ability to manifest. Uh, your desires, but I think it's it's also current language. It's a way that we would think of it in a way that makes sense to us. This would not be the way that a traditional magician might think of it or somebody in an indigenous tribe. Uh, but I, as again, the reason why I talk of it in those terms is because that's the language that we use today. Yeah, and that language has been translated, as you say, to multiple books, especially in the self-help category, like right. The Secret, Think and Grow Rich, The Alchemist. And they also mention visualizing, having already achieved the goal, believing that it already happened. What's the science behind these affirmations and these visualizations? And you also mention symbols, how symbols are important in creating goals, in trying to manifest what you want to happen. So the symbols, the rituals, the, uh, the dark hooded robes, the candles, all, all of that is theater, essentially. Hmm. And the, but it's important because it, uh, it helps focus the mind. So if you, I mean, there, there are two ways of going about it. One is meditation, which is completely interior, although there are active forms of meditation. The other way is much more uh, uh, driven by the external world. So if you, if you need a ritual or you need a candle or a pendant or something to help focus your mind, well, that works too because it's all about focus. Um, how does it work? How, how, how would this happen from a scientific perspective? The answer is we don't know. Hmm. So all we have at this point are speculation. So one speculation is uh, that when you place uh, a desire in the future, that the probabilities start moving in such a way that you will end up at that place. So you, you, you state the affirmation in the present tense, typically, although you, you think of it as, this is where I'm heading, I'm heading to that thing. So I've done experiments to, to see if we could test this idea where uh, you, you set a goal which unknown to the person actually is in the future. It's only about a second in the future, but nevertheless, the, the, the goal of the experiment is a future event. 
Uh, and what you find in these experiments is that that's what happens. People are able to achieve the event even though it's in the future. I'm gonna change my background because the light is hitting it in a funny way. It's making it shimmer. So let's go into this room. That's a little better. <laughs> So, so to, to, to repeat, we don't have a, uh, a solid scientific explanation of what's going on at this point, but it looks like it's a goal-directed or a teleological process. You draw yourself into the future you want to be in, as opposed to pushing yourself. See, it's like from two different directions of time. If you're already at the goal, you pull your past self towards yourself. And if you're in present time, you push yourself towards the goal that you wish to achieve. So interestingly, the idea of a symmetry in time is, is pretty well accepted in physics. I mean, uh, all of the equations of classical and quantum mechanics are time symmetric. Mm. And in fact, in many cases, time doesn't even come into play into the equations. So at least the, the, what we can say is that uh, affirmations, if they're in fact goal-directed, are not violating what we know about the physical world. Mm -hmm. What we don't understand yet exactly is how does consciousness interact with all of this in order to make it happen. And so you have to, you have to uh, take off your science hat and put on your esoteric history hat. And then we start talking about things like small C consciousness and big C consciousness. Those are not part of science yet, but that seems to be a viable explanation that's been around for 10,000 years as opposed to science, which is about 300 years. So the time itself uh, spent with these ideas doesn't mean one is better than the other, uh, but we do have evidence that science is pretty good at what it does. Otherwise, things like this Zoom conference would not be possible. So. I think science will eventually catch up to, uh, to ancient ideas and we'll have different language and different ways of thinking about it at those terms uh, with new terms, but nevertheless, we'll find that many of, the, of these esoteric ideas are in fact correct. And saying that science is gonna catch up, I feel like the world is catching up. Well, not catching up because it's been here for so long, but this self-help books, people like Tony Robbins, Joe Dispenza, they're starting to question Deepak Chopra, the validity of uh, medicine and uh, scientific statements, you could say. And people are more open to new ideas, to ideas from esoteric backgrounds. And I feel that science has to catch up to the inner world, as, as you've said before. Right. I think it's important to say that what, while it's important to always question everything, I mean, science is all about skepticism, really. Uh, what we have learned in science is valid, right? We don't, we don't want to throw away the baby with the bathwater, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But what we do want to do is to prevent science from collapsing into a kind of dogma. And the, the do it's very easy to do that. You start getting a sense of that we know exactly how things work, and then anything that comes along that challenges that is simply dismissed and say that's impossible. Well, that's no longer science. That becomes science as a kind of religion. And so part of the goal then of what I think should be taught in the, as a scientific career, first of all, is humility. We don't really know that much about the, the nature of everything. We've learned a lot of very interesting things. We have great instruments that allow, allow us to test things. And we don't want to throw away what works, but we do want to expand it. Mm -hmm. And the history of science is all about this. It's all about evolving our ideas about how things work. And every time a new instrument is developed, we, it's like whole new realms of reality just open up. Before the microscope, we had no idea what was going on at the microscopic level. Before the telescope, we didn't have any idea about that. Every new instrument gives us a new window into reality and it expands our sense of what we thought was possible. A, a great example is, is quantum mechanics. The, the shift from classical to quantum mechanics only now because of being taught to younger and younger people for many years, for probably the first 50 at least years of quantum mechanics being around, not only did few people know what it meant, but 
even fewer people had any idea of what it was about to do to our sense of what physical reality is like. Hmm. So it has radically changed. So when you hear people today saying, well, things like psychic phenomena can't be true because they violate the laws of physics. What I immediately think of is they're thinking of Newton. They're thinking <laughs> of 17th century physics, not what is currently available now. And so if you look at just that change, that took a long time to happen, but, but science is rapidly proceeding in many different dimensions. Uh, for someone to say now that this violates the laws of physics tells me that they don't know what the laws of physics are. And I think it's just that humanity is, uh, has historically been afraid of the unknown. I'm curious yep. to see what would happen if, uh, you gave a psychedelic compound to a scientific, a, a scientist that's very skeptical and he sees this other realms of consciousness, what would he think then? They, they would, uh, two things could happen. One is that they would have a transformative experience. And they suddenly become way more sympathetic, at least, to other ways of perceiving reality. The other possibility is that they would have that experience and they would quickly forget it. Hmm. Because it's very difficult for an academic to appear to be sympathetic to ideas that are not popular. Like if you're, if you're a junior faculty, you won't get tenure. If you're a tenured faculty, you might lose your grants. If you're a, or even a retired professor, you might be afraid of your legacy if you, look, if you appear to be too sympathetic. Mm -hmm. But I think fortunately, there, uh, because of the research that is coming out now, and published in, in really uh, good journals, and because of the places that are doing this kind of research, that it's beginning to loosen up the taboo that, are, that have essentially scared academics from talking about this stuff openly. And I think that trend will continue. How the, the current pandemic changes all this, anybody's guess. I, I, haven't, I really don't even know how, how to think about what will happen. What I hope happens, though, is that we will become more tolerant and ab about the limitations of science and also what science can do. So we'll eventually have a vaccine. We'll eventually figure out what's going on. That is not going to happen because it drops out of the sky. Mm -hmm. It takes millions of people working with billions of dollars to make it happen. Uh, so I hope it reminds people who are skeptical about what science is all about that, yeah, actually, we've learned a couple of good things and there's plenty more to go. Yeah. And, and I think this pandemic is just going to spark more curiosity and definitely more funding towards science because it's needed now more than ever. I hope so. Yep. W what was one experiment that completely shattered your belief system that after you performed it, you're like, there's no way this could be real. That happens after every successful experiment. <laughs> it, it's one of the reasons why you keep doing them again and again, because you say, oh, that, that's like, that's crazy. That can't possibly be correct. Uh, it's also one of the reasons why within parapsychology, the replication rate of experiments is much higher than any other domain. And, and this is because you have someone like myself who went through a pretty traditional educational background and I was curious about these things, but I, I don't have a lot of psychic experiences. It's not like I was driven into this because of psychic experiences. I was driven by curiosity. So I started doing experiments and I would get interesting results. Uh, oh, you, do you get that, that sign there? No. Automatically up, upgraded to uh, unlimited Zoom. Oh, great. So, Thank you, Zoom. <laughs> yeah, so Zoom is doing very nicely and just giving unlimited time. So I, I would say that the thing which, which really struck me and, and made me change my career direction was uh, when I was working at Bell Labs, I started doing these experiments as part of my work. And then I started going to conferences and I made a few presentations and I caught the eye of people who were doing this work for the US government, but in a classified domain. So it wasn't it wasn't known publicly that they were doing this. So about a year later, I got an invitation to join that project. And so I did. And so it was highly classified. Uh, and the thing which struck me was I knew from working at Bell Labs and other places what big science is like. I mean, you have thousands of technical people, scientists, laboratories, 
there's a lot of interesting stuff going on. Well, so this, the work being done for the US government was at a similar facility. Lots of very well-trained scientists doing all kinds of interesting stuff, except that our focus was primarily remote viewing and, and for the application of espionage. That's why I was classified. So I got the, uh, the required clearances and then I got the briefing of what do we currently know about remote viewing, especially in terms of its usefulness in, in a military or in uh, intelligence context. And so I saw uh, example after example of very high quality remote viewing that was useful for intelligence purposes, like identifying structures and people and places and things on the other side of the world where anybody in the US did not know what it was. So first of all, I had never seen that quality of remote viewing before. I mean, almost like, uh, like the pictures were being drawn by somebody looking at the target, literally, like directly. Uh, and in, given the context that these were targets that our intelligence people did not actually know what they were. But nevertheless, here's lots of information being given about not only what is outside a building, but what's inside a building and where the building, what will happen nine months in the future and so on. So given this context of being briefed in a highly classified program and seeing many examples of how useful high talents are in this domain, that's when I decided that if, if it was a way to continue doing this kind of research as my profession, that's what I wanted to do because mm. I'd never encountered anything that curious before. And remember this, this was now in the mid 1980s. And at the time, uh, in order for this kind of a program to be useful, to be pr particularly useful in the intelligence world, it was also useful for everyone outside the building we were working in to think that there was nothing to it. Right. If you have some kind of special ability, mm. special satellite, whatever, you don't want other people paying attention to it. Mm -hmm. So in this case, there are all there were rumors about what the government may or may not be doing with psychic phenomena. And so there were articles out there saying, no, this is nonsense. And there were, there were scientists who were publishing papers saying, no, this is not good work and none of it's real. That's strategically useful because while inside the building in our classified zone, we were working with very highly talented psychics, outside the building, at least from a, the way it was being presented, it didn't even exist. So fortunately, we're past that era now. And there's a lots of very, very good uh, studies that have been published. Unfortunately, the, the historical skepticism is still there because the old publications are there. And if you only read that material, you'll come away thinking, well, I guess there's nothing to it. If you read all of the material, you'll have a very different perspective. Hmm. So, so that that's that was the thing that caused me to pay most attention was working with people who are very highly talented, like people I had never met before. But having met them now, I know that this is a real skill. Some people are much better at it than others. And for people who are at the top of their game, who are highly talented, they can do truly amazing things. And so as a scientist, I want to know why, how in the world is that possible? Well, again, we don't know exactly yet, but we're we're moving in that direction. And how were you recruited to this secret government program? Did uh, a guy in a suit like come in and say, "Hey, Dean, we want to recruit you for"? Like, is it in, like in the movies, or do you get an email? It was more or less like that, except you didn't have a suit <laughs> <laughs> and a t-shirt. Yeah, so it, it was one of the people who was working on the project at the time who was coming to the conferences and saw me give a talk. And so we, we just started talking about it. And uh, I knew he was working at the facility, but it, like everyone else, I didn't know exactly what they were doing. So at, at some point later, he, then he basically invited me to come and see whether I'd be interested in doing that. Wow. And what do you speculate is going on in uh, Area 31? Uh, as far as I know, there is no Area 31. Do, do you, you mean the, the 61? The, is it 61? No. What is it? 51? Area, Area 51. 51. 51. Yeah. Um, maybe there is a 31. 31 is probably much more secret than 51. <laughs> well, I, I have no idea. 
I mean, yeah. one of the things and you find very quickly in a classified world is that you, you, you know what you need to know and you don't know mm -hmm. anything else. So I, I have no idea. Yeah, I, I would imagine. And how do these people that are practicing um, these psychic abilities, how do they get into that state of, uh, I don't know, higher being of being able to communicate with this, uh, with this exterior force or having this visions, how, how, do they, how do they prepare themselves in order to try to, for example, see a building that might be a few kilometers away? Well, the people who are very talented don't need to do very much because they naturally do it. Mm -hmm. uh, to maintain proficiency still requires a lot of practice. And among the, the remote viewers I know who are quite good, they spend at least a few minutes just mentally calming down. So if you're an experienced meditator and, and you, you want to or you need to calm down, you can do that very quickly because you, you just go into whatever mental space that is and you drop down into it quickly. For a beginning meditator, it takes a long time to learn how to do that. But once you're used to it, you, you can drop into it in a matter of minutes. And... In some cases, uh, it's not so much that you're, you're spending a lot of time getting calm. There's a, some kind of mental switch that happens where you can flip it very quickly. And so one time I was driving, I, I was a passenger in a car and the remote viewer was the driver. And so I took uh, one of the folders, which had, we, had, uh, we had many, many photographs in opaque folders that we use for targets and they're always being scrambled so you, you'd pick one you didn't know what was in it i didn't know what was in it it was a photograph and i said well let's try this while we're driving you're driving you're the remote viewer you tell me what you think is inside this envelope so he did so he he described it and afterwards he made a little sketch and then we checked it and he was like a perfect hit so this was a good example of somebody who was able even while driving to, to go into that mental state where he's, he's simply able to get that kind of information. Uh, others just do it over breakfast, you know, you, while eating breakfast. So it, it doesn't, for, with, with a lot of practice and some talent, it doesn't take much time at all to be able to get into that state. It's only for people who are learning or people who are not much talented that they may take a lot more time to get into this state of samadhi, satori, gnosis whatever we wish to call it and what do you think the modern tools for studying the subconscious are going to be because i don't think they're going to be mechanical or definitely they're going to be like psychedelics meditation but times 10 how could that look like well as you said it'll, it'll be meditation uh the uh, modern methods of neurofeedback now like with uh the the muse devices, a neurofeedback system costs like $200. That's a major step forward because with neurofeedback, since we're, we're all used to technology at this point, if we can get our own brain waves and learn to navigate brain waves, then in some ways it's similar to what meditation is all about anyway, except it takes longer because you, you're not getting a, an objective real-time feedback. So neurofeedback is one method, uh, things like transcranial magnetic stimulation and uh, transcranial ultrasound stimulation are going to come on board. Uh, I'm a chairman of a company that's using genetic methods that will be able to help stimulate these kinds of effects as well. Uh, there'll be new synthetic um, psychedelics that will be developed, and they're all going to be combined. So but one, of the, one of the things about modern medicine in general is that it'll be personalized because we all have a lot of similarities, but we also have our own peculiar differences. And so if you have a, somebody has a problem, physical or mental, we're not even a problem. They, do, they want to be a, a perfect meditator in 20 minutes. You need to personalize that to the predilections of that individual, both their physiology, their mental state, their background, their culture, their language, all of that. I think we're going to move into a direction where you'd have somebody... Uh, take a series of tests, perhaps, and then someone will use something like a, a tricorder from Star Trek and sort of measure how you work physiologically. 
and they'll say, well, for you, we, we have, uh, um, we have a compound, uh, of 25,000 compounds, but this one's the one that's going to work for you best. And so some of it is genetics and some of it is synthetic compound and some of it will be some kind of a stimulation method and then it will work because it is, because it is made for you as opposed to mindfulness meditation will work for everyone. Hmm. Actually, that's not true. It'll work for a lot of people, probably over 90%, but somewhere between two and 10% of people when they start meditating, they'll, go, they'll become psychotic. They'll, they'll go crazy basically because their particular makeup is not really suitable for that kind of meditation, whereas something else might be much, much better. So that's, that answers your question. That we're still not there, of course, but who knows, 10 years, 15 years? Well, it's, everything's been incredible, Dean. I've had an amazing time talking to you. It's been very eye-opening. Is there anything else that you'd like to say or anything specific that you'd like to promote? Well, one thing I would like to suggest that if, if I were, uh, I, I oftentimes think, uh, given that I've had a, a somewhat unusual career, uh, who are the people who encouraged me and who are the people who discouraged me from going in this direction? Well, fortunately, there were many more who encouraged rather than discouraged. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't have done this. But it takes a certain amount of risk. As I look back on it, I have no regrets at all even though it is risky. It's risky in many different ways. So I would say then for younger people who are interested in, well, what, what, what should I do? The answer is you need to try a lot of things because you need to find something that you're really passionate about. You find something that you find interesting and passionate and you want to do that, figure out some way of doing that because then you'll never work a day in your life. And so I, I'm working now for 40 years past my doctorate and I really don't feel like it's work. I'm getting paid to do what I want to do. That's what everyone should strive to be able to do. Not everyone is in a position to be able to do that, but as a goal, try enough things to find out what really find that you find most passionate about and do that. And at some point it might change and then figure out another thing and do that, but always try to follow your passion. And manifest it too. Focus on it, envision it, live it, breathe it, and you'll achieve it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you have to work it too. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's beautiful, Dean. Thank you so much, man. You're welcome. Thank you for watching this episode of the Rebound Talks podcast. I really hope you enjoyed it. We're coming out with episodes every single Wednesday. So please subscribe, leave a like, and if you found anything useful, comment it down below. See you next week.